A group of Democratic Republicans were pegged as the instigators of the rebellion, and Hamilton used the event as a ploy to crush opposition to the Federalist Party in Pennsylvania. This was a chance for the Federalists to show that a standing army was necessary to prevent internal disruption. Washington also capitalized on the moment and placed blame on groups determined to resist federal authority. After this, Democratic-Republican societies ceased operation, and Federalists gained control of Congress following the 1794 elections. In foreign policy, Washington wished for the United States to remain neutral in European affairs. He issued a neutrality proclamation in 1793, a questionable move constitutionally, but one that was designed to keep the United States out of foreign conflict. He thought the United States was simply too weak to get involved in European affairs, and if it were too weakened, then a foreign government could come and quickly destroy it. Washington believed the United States should remain a peaceful trading partner with the rest of the world. When presented with John Jay's controversial Treaty of Amity, Commerce, and Navigation with Great Britain in 1794, he hesitated to sign it for fear that the U.S. would be dragged into the international conflict between the French and the British. Southerners also denounced the treaty as purely sectional, claiming it would only favor northern commercial interests at the expense of the rest of the country, and then it kowtowed to the British. Hamilton said it was the best treaty they could hope for, that it resolved remaining disputes between the two countries, it would ensure the peace and promote commerce, and it urged Washington to support the measure. (laughs) And he urged Washington to support the measure. Washington sent the treaty to the Senate for ratification, and it took effect in 1796, but it remained a contentious issue. Washington almost decided against a second term in 1792. He told Jefferson that he was feeling the effects of age, and both his mind and body were beginning to fail him. Finally, his sense of duty and the international difficulties confronting the United States obliged him to accept a second term, but it would be his last. He looked forward to retirement, even though some would suggest he was leaving because of falling popularity and a tarnished image. He had not escaped eight years as president without political and personal attacks, even from one-time friends and associates. Regardless, Washington believed he left the United States on firm ground both internationally and domestically. And many of the fault lines that appear in American society, such as Southerners believing that the Northerners were acting only in their own interests but imposing the cost on the rest of the United States, so these sectional divisions between North and South, The questions of a Hamiltonian view of a strong central government versus a Jeffersonian view of an educated gentleman farmer. These are divisions that continue throughout the next several decades of the United States and are not resolved until the Civil War as formal integrated policy of the United States. And many people don't consider them completely resolved now. There are many who still think that the Jeffersonian view should prevail, not the Hamiltonian view. Now, I'm going to read Washington's farewell address, and it's a very sober and, I think, high-minded statement from a statesman reflecting on his career. Before I do that, I want to mention that Washington was a man, or at least he held himself as a person of integrity, but he knew how to party. This is something I came across a few years ago, and it's a document on the bar tab of Washington's going away party. This is something his troops threw him in 1787 before he and others signed off on the Constitution. So this is before he's president. And the celebration was held at Philadelphia's historic city tavern. George and 54 of his closest friends consumed this much in one night. 54 bottles of Madeira, which is this Portuguese wine popular among the aristocratic class in the colonies, 60 bottles of Claret, 22 bottles of Porter, 12 bottles of beer, 8 bottles of hard cider, eight bottles of colonial whiskey, and seven large bowls of spiked punch. Wow. Now, we don't know if these bottles are the size of the typical 750 milliliter fifths, or if they're smaller or larger, or what the alcohol content of these bottles are. But whatever the denominations are, it's a lot of booze. So however much Washington imbibed, he knew how to have a festive time. Okay. Well, let me get back to Washington's farewell address, where he is leaving behind the United States that he fears could grow in division and some of these unresolved issues that weren't settled by the Constitutional Convention, by the War of Independence, he feared could break the United States into wholly different nations, which it almost did 80 years later. Here's what Washington said in his farewell address. The open letter to the public appeared in newspapers across the country And perhaps it's Washington's most famous public document. 
He covered the most popular political topics of the day. He warned against political parties and factionalism. He urged his successors and those in Congress to maintain a strict construction of the Constitution and use amendments where necessary to alter its limitations. He cautioned against excessive government borrowing and insisted on morality through religion. He thought that these guidelines were the only way to maintain the republic. And he argued, in addition, that permanent foreign alliances were dangerous to the future security of the United States and threatened American sovereignty. Once Washington retired to Mount Vernon in 1797, he hoped that it would be for the last time. But when the French threatened war with the United States in 1798, Washington answered the call again. President John Adams appointed Washington Lieutenant General and Commander-in-Chief of American Forces. Washington demanded that Hamilton be named second in command with full authority over the army. Adams resisted, but Washington won the War of Wills, and Hamilton began the process of organizing an army. At 66, Washington wanted to act as little more than a figurehead and desired Hamilton to complete the difficult tasks of administration. But fortunately, Washington wouldn't have to lead the army against France, and this is probably Adams' greatest achievement in his one term in office, and that's avoiding war with France. As tension with the French subsided throughout 1798 and 1799, Washington settled into a routine at Mount Vernon. He never fully recovered financially from the Revolution, but during his last years in retirement, almost achieved self-sufficiency at his estate. The problems of caring for and maintaining slaves weighed on him financially. Though selling off some of his slaves might have alleviated his problems, he abhorred breaking apart families and refused to participate in the slave traffic. He supported the gradual abolition of slavery, but he thought that a forced end to the institution would only create more evil than good. Washington believed slavery to be an inefficient and paternalistic institution and thought it would die out naturally, and economically, it sort of looked like that's where it was going in the United States, before the invention of the cotton gin, slavery simply wasn't as economical in the early 19th century as it would be in the third or fourth or fifth decades of the 19th century, and that's where slavery has a roaring comeback in the South and isn't put down till the Civil War. So though he was unsatisfied with the economic and moral ramifications of the institution, Washington continued as a slaveholder until his death. He manumitted his slaves in his will. Washington died suddenly in December 1799. He had spent two days outdoors in the bad weather. He caught a cold that soon turned into a severe case of laryngitis and swelling of his throat. Washington had trouble breathing and instructed his personal physician to administer bloodletting. This process had worked for his slaves, and he believed in its therapeutic effects. When his condition grew worse, Washington prepared for the end. Because of the extreme loss of blood, he was too weak to fight his oncoming demise, but Washington reassured those around him that he was not afraid. He died peacefully on December 14, 1799, with his wife at his side, just two years after leaving the presidency. All right, well, let's talk about some of the legacies of Washington. George Washington established several important precedents while president. Until 1940, no president sought more than two consecutive terms in office. There was no provision against it. And Washington could have remained president for life. Had he done so, other presidents could have done so. And this could have severely weakened the democratic rotation of offices that were part of American life for almost 200 years. The Constitution didn't impose term limits on the executive, but Washington was mindful of preserving the office of the president from any connotations of monarchy. No one in the revolutionary generation dared break his precedent of serving more than two consecutive terms. Washington also added a famous line to the oath of office. The Constitution stipulates that the president must take the following oath or affirmation before taking office. I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of the president of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Washington attached the phrase, so help me God, to the end of the oath, even though he, interestingly enough, didn't really use the term God much, but providence, but the addition still remains. Washington gravitated toward Hamilton in the final years of his administration, but he maintained that the Constitution should be followed literally and strictly, that Congress should have the ultimate authority on most political matters. He issued the first proclamation of Thanksgiving and began the process of delivering the State of the Union address to Congress in person. This precedent was ignored for more than 100 years until it was revived by Woodrow Wilson. 
In his own State of the Union, Washington didn't make any big requests for appropriations or money. He simply asked Congress to consider measures that he deemed important. Also, Washington wasn't much of a speechmaker. He had dentures that basically held on to one brave bicuspid that was still in his mouth. Many of his public speeches are only about a paragraph long. This is in stark contrast to Thomas Jefferson or John Adams or Teddy Roosevelt, who would go on all day long if you gave them the chance. At the end of his life, Richard Lee, Robert E. Lee's father, who had served with Washington, gave this statement of him. Possessing a clear and penetrating mind, a strong and sound judgment, calmness and temper for deliberation, with invincible firmness and perseverance and resolutions maturely formed, drawing information from all, acting from himself with incorruptible integrity and unvarying patriotism, his own superiority and public confidence alike marked him as the man designed by heaven to lead into the great political as well as military events which have distinguished the era of his life. So that's how Washington has been remembered by many. Here's a few other things about Washington. I mentioned that he was very large for his time. He was about six foot, six foot two, 180, 190 pounds. He had large hands and feet size 13 shoes. According to Dr. Reidegar Sognosis, former dean at the University of California at Los Angeles School of Dentistry, which has made a detailed study of Washington's dentures, he was fitted with numerous sets that were fashioned variously from lead, ivory, and teeth of humans, cows, and other animals, but not made from wood, as popularly believed. It would rot, and that just wouldn't make sense when it's in your mouth all the time. Mold could develop. And he wasn't completely toothless. Upon his inauguration as president, Washington had one of his own teeth left to work alongside the dentures. He began wearing reading glasses during the revolution and dressed fashionably. In terms of personality, he took few friends into complete confidence. His critics mistook his dignified reserve for being pompous. Life for Washington was a serious mission, a job that he tackled soberly, and he had little time for humor. He was good-natured, basically, but he wrestled with his temper and sometimes lost it, especially when his militia forces during the Revolutionary War weren't fighting up to the standard he expected of them. He was a poor public speaker, and he could be utterly inarticulate without a prepared text. He preferred to express himself on paper. So he benefited by being president at a time before mass communications, because he probably wouldn't fare very well in televised debates, and it makes you wonder about the type of leaders we're missing out on in the age of mass communication. But when he did speak, he was direct and candid and looked people squarely in the eye. Biographer Douglas Freeman wrote that Washington's ambition for wealth made him acquisitive and sometimes contentious. Even after Washington established himself, Freeman pointed out he would insist upon the exact payment of every farthing due to him and was determined to get everything that he honestly could. But neither his ambition to succeed nor his acquisitive nature ever threaten his basic integrity. Now, there's a few other things that I think are worth looking over with Washington, and this is an interesting episode for his life. Washington, as a farmer, helped bring mules to America. Mules were the cousins of donkeys. The time honored name for the donkey was the jackass. Bible scholars know that the donkey is listed in the translated Bible as the ass. Jackass came along in the English language because of the every man in Old England was a John or a familiar Jack. From this, we encountered the lumberjack, the bootjack, jack of all trades, and jackrabbit, so that's where jackass comes from. But mules are not native to America. George Washington developed an interest in the animal when he heard that farms throughout Spain were using a work animal that was stronger and more sure-footed than either the horse or the donkey, and it also ate less. He asked the U.S. ambassador to Spain to inquire about the animal. In what was a very interesting task in this ambassador's assignment, he learned it was the infertile offspring of a jackass and a horse mare. In 1785, King Charles III sent Washington a male as a gift. George liked him and named him appropriately Royal Gift. He became impressed with the animal and spent time in the 15 years before his death breeding mules. Mount Vernon had 58 working mules, and regional farmers began breeding their own stock from Georgia's. The mule was America's favorite plow animal until the advent of the tractor. So he was both father and farmer to his country. Hey everyone, Scott here. 
One more brief word from our sponsors. 